Good evening, Baido. You are muted. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Yeah, I think Mondira, good evening. I think within a few seconds, they'll start. Mondia, hello Mondia. She's also muted. Mondia, uh, kindly unmute. Acha. Uh, Mondia, go ahead. Uh, you have the complete link in your WhatsApp, right? Not. Uh, I am joining through my laptop. Okay. Did uh, Did Babon send you the link in WhatsApp? The complete link, not the ID and the password. The complete link. <laughs> Uh, no, I called him up and I asked him to send it through my mail so that it's all easy for me to open through my mail. Okay. Yeah, okay. the complete link. The complete link you got. No, but uh, here, uh, Professor Apurba Kumar Das is having some pro problem. So I have asked Bhavan to, you know, copy paste and send it to me here in WhatsApp. I'll send it across to him. No, no, Archana, I think you have to send him the meeting ID only and the six digit um, passcode. And the passcode. Meaning that I have already said, that I've sent to all the speakers. I've already shared. Okay. But he's asked, he asked for the complete link, which I gave him. And now he wants me to again, uh, you know, copy paste it and send it. So I have asked Babon to give it to me. He says oh, he will do uh -huh. it. He will do it. I think you have asked, he will do it. Janobi Janupi, are you online? Yes, yes, Bajo. Okay, good evening. Good evening. I think uh, Tribeni is online also. She's. Hello? Yes. Tribeni? Tribeni, is she online? I don't see. Is she online? Her. No, yeah. she hasn't joined. She hasn't joined. Okay. I think just uh, after one minute, just, yeah, it will start now. So uh, I think he have joined. Uh, Dr. Das, can you hear me? Hello, hello. He's connecting to yeah. the audio. Yeah. Hello. My name is Mr. Phone calling. I'm meeting with Nata Sir. I think uh, Baban can go ahead. Achana, hello. Achana, please unmute. 
Rachana, please. Uh, yes. I think we, still has... five, we still have five minutes to go, by the Oh, uh, yeah. Let him just show the, you know, the banner and all. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this is just to confirm, am I audible? Uh, this is Professor Kuruboda speaking. Yes, yes, very much. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Okay. So. I think Dr. Rambus has also joined. Yeah, I have seen him. Yes, good evening. I have already joined. <laughs> <laughs> good evening, Dr. Vooj. Good evening. Uh, good, good evening and Namaskar, Dr. Vooj. I'm Bhagavati <laughs> here. Uh, namaskar, namaskar. <laughs> uh, how are you? Fine, all everything is fine over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vuj, as fine as can be expected during this COVID-19 <laughs> COVID <laughs> pandemic. Definitely. We all have to. We have all become kind of, you know, uh, virtual friendly now. That's true. <laughs> And we have to also go along with the pandemic. No way out. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, adapting to this new normal or what? Yes, <laughs> yes, very much, very much. Yes. We are already new normal. Hmm. Uh, is it seven, Archana? Uh, I think. Just one minute to go. I okay. have already informed Baban to start okay. exactly at uh, seven o'clock. Okay, so it will be flagged up by the anchor, Mandira, by welcoming mm. all. Mm. Namaste. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome all dignitaries and participants on behalf of CTEF Assam chapter to this webinar on environmental awareness, Save Mother Earth. 
organized and hosted by CTEF Assam chapter with technical support of Gracia Technology Private Limited, Guwahati. We are indeed delighted to have you with us in this webinar and appreciate the effort made by you in taking the initiative to be present in this event. We shall begin today's proceedings with the state anthem of Assam. May I now request Brescia Technology to play the video. Now, I invite Professor Nilima Bhagavuti, International Secretary General, CTEF, and Chairperson, CTEF Assam Chapter, to present her welcome address. Dr. Nilima Bhagavuti oh. has been the heart and soul of CTEF Assam Chapter and the main thrust behind the events organized in this area. Professor Bhagavuti, Emeritus Professor, Guwahati University retired in 2015. Professor Bhagavati is a national awardee for her contribution in the field of education and research. She is a Commonwealth Fellow Awardee 2006 and winner of National Best Teacher Award. She is also CTEF Kerala Chapters Best Emeritus Professor sure. Radio Awardee of 2019. With these words, the very short introduction, I invite Professor Bhagavati for the welcome note. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Mandira Bordoloi. Huba Hoidha, Aru Hokaluke Moor Namaskar Zanaisu. Good evening and pranam to all. On behalf of Council for Teacher Education Foundation and Council for Teacher Education Foundation, Assam Chapter, and Gracia Technology, our partner in the area of technology. We welcome you. We welcome you to this national webinar, which is being organized on a very pertinent theme, a very need-based theme today. In fact, let me just brief you a little bit about CTEF. Uh, to start with, CTEF, Council for Teacher Education Foundation, it is the brainchild of Dr. Golab Chorusia, who was an eminent educationist. He was a teacher educator, a global teacher, global thinker, an administrator, and above all, he was very much associated with the educational policies and educational policy implementation in the country. It was he who sowed the seed of CTEF, earlier it was known as CTE, Council for Teacher Education. Uh, from 2015 onwards, it has become Council for Teacher Education Foundation. 
And just with a handful of stalwarts from the field of education, he started the beginning. He flagged off the beginning. And today, Council for Teacher Education has 23 chapters in the country, and we have three overseas chapters in Nepal, in Dhaka, and in UK. So let me just brief you a little bit what we are doing in CTF. CTF, in fact, the prime objective is to develop teachers based on competency, based on resourcefulness, and skillful teachers. In fact, to make them very, very competent teaching professionals. With this prime objective, the Council for Teacher Education Foundation, it undertakes in all the chapters equally in the country and overseas professional development programs. And the professional development program, it varies. Like say, we have teacher exchange program, we have seminars, we have conferences, we have interactive sessions, we have publications, journal publication, global, uh, what we say, the research journal. And also we hold and undertake lots of activities for the student community along with the teaching community. So right from 2020, we, along with the pandemic going on in the country, we are not sitting idle. We are into the virtual field now. And in 2020, the entire year, we conducted activities both for the teachers and for the student community. 21, we started off with number of webinars. We started with global conferences. And in fact, from July, the second phase of our webinar series, we have started from the month of July and today's webinar is the fifth of the second series. And next for the 22, we are again talking programs. In fact, our pipeline as how we can give service to the teaching community and the student community in the country. Therefore, this organization, I am proud to say that it is the leading organization in the country. It is the leading organization in fact, because we have more than a huge family let me say a huge family, we have more than 12,000 members. And besides that, all the members, between all the members, we have excellent network. So it makes us very cohesive family, right from the north to south, from east to west in the country, and the other three international chapters. Now, when we talk about, say, Council for Teacher Education, I already told you that it is a leading organization in the country. and even in pandemic, we are trying to do lots of works, but one thing we are giving very much stress right now is the implementation of the national education policy and its massive awareness in the country. With that idea, all the districts which we have in Assam, they are undertaking various programs where the national education policy 2020 has been given high focus on it. Assam chapter, was established in the year 2001. And since then, we are not looking back. We are vigorously, dedicatedly working and we have excellent team members, both in the district and both in the state. Therefore, it is making us a little bit easier to go ahead with different programs from time to time. And also I'm proud to say that City of Assam, we were given the best performing chapter in the country in the year 2020. So this is a sort of motivation to us to work hard, to us to work more vigorously, to reach all the teachers of the state, right from the lower primary to the higher secondary and including teacher education. So these 23 chapters, I do hope all are really sincerely doing work only with the motive to give service to the nation by developing skillful, resourceful, and competent teachers. Let me come to today's team. Today's team is very much aware. Everybody knows we are all talking about the environment degradation. We all know what is happening. We know all about the climate change which is going on. The forest, we all know what is happening in our own state and in other states as well. What is happening to the rivers, we all know about it, but we have organized this particular webinar to make a massive awareness by inviting three wonderful, brilliant resource persons 
so that they can make us more enriched with knowledge how to go about, how to reach our teaching community and student community more with the knowledge of saving the Mother Earth. What or uh, which way we have to go forward to save the Mother Earth because all of us know we have no other planet to migrate. We have to do our best, we have to aware of ourselves. We have to reach all people from the bottom to the top to be aware and to do our best to save the country, to save the world, in fact. Now, coming very briefly, because the time is also very constrained for me for giving the welcome address. We have, I mentioned, three wonderful resource persons. These three wonderful resource persons, first of all, I should thank them, thank them for giving their consent instantly, instantly. Dr. Ram Bhuch, a very eminent person, associated with UNESCO on environmental issues. Dr. Vivav Talukdar, the CEO of Arena, the forefront NGO in the country. And Professor Apurbo Kumar Das, the eminent professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Tejpur University. They all have come to support us and to give hands, to give support and to make us understand what we are going to do. So definitely this webinar all the persons, all the people who are viewing in YouTube, they will benefit. They will come to know what is the role to save the Mother Earth. Because we people, we have to survive. We have to survive in this world, in this planet. And that is what we and how we should be aware of. Friends, let me just tell you uh, about these three resource persons. They have distinct are giving academic as well as practical service in the field of econ environmental science. Starting with Dr. Ram Bhuj. He is associated, he was associated, he is associated and he will be associated in this field. And he will go on giving us guidance to what to do in future. Sir, we welcome you to this webinar. We are extremely thankful to you for your positive response and we are sure we are going to benefit what you are going to deliver today. Dr. Bivov Talukdar is very much well-known in the national front as well as international front. He is CEO in Arenak, the NGO, which each and every person knows working in the field of environment. He has given lots of service, not only by presenting papers in different countries or in the state itself, but by visiting the different nations till now. And it is a leading organization in the country, Arenak. I welcome you, sir, to this webinar. And I hope that what you are going to present will benefit all the viewers profusely. And I'm sure this will be the eye opener to all. We have with us, the Professor Apurva Kumar Das, an eminent, an eminent, I should repeat again, Professor of Tejpur University. And let me say that when I talked with the registrar of Tejpur University, I just asked him that, can you recommend one professor from the Department of Environmental Science who can give us knowledge, feed us with knowledge, rich knowledge to, and have massive awareness about the environmental degradation and how to protect the mother. Instantly, he told me there is no other than Professor Upurva Kumar Das. So we, I'm really grateful to you, sir, for your instant, for your instant consent. You are here today with us and I welcome you, sir. We had another resource person with us, Dr. Pranjit Sharma, is assistant professor, Department of Geography, Mangalde College, but he is not keeping well. So he sent me the message due to his voice problem, but he is joining. I'm surely he is joining in this webinar and he is here. I welcome you, Dr. Pranjit Sharma. I welcome the entire family members of Gracia Technology. I welcome all the family members of Council for Teacher Education Foundation. I welcome all the life members, all the viewers and the student community with uh, they are joining us today. With these words, I have strong belief which I should express that this is going to be a very impactful, impactful webinar. 
And we are looking forward to hear the wonderful, brilliant resource persons today we have. With these words, pranam again to all of you. And I let us go ahead with the program. Over to Mandira Badului. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for the wonderful, warm welcome and also elaborating on the working of the CTEF in general, and also specifically about CTEF Assam chapter. Now I invite Dr. Jahnabi L. Barwa, Secretary CTEF Assam, to elaborate on the concept note of the webinar. Over to you, Jahnabi. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mandira Welcome you all and namaskar to all of you. Good evening. Our subject resource persons, Dr. Ram Bosa, Dr. Vibhav Talundu, Professor Arup Kumar Dalsar, Professor Nilima Bhagavati Baito, and a large number of city India, dear students, uh, dear viewers. You all know that Today's topic is environmental awareness and safe mother earth. Our earth is the only planet with the continuity of life. So it becomes more and more important to gather a sense of urgency of serving our mother earth from all sorts of planet harming activities. Our mother earth needs to be safe as our survival depends complete, completely on this planet. It is our responsibility to raise awareness about serving our mother earth. Earth provides every resources for our livelihood. Our planet harming activities are resulting in causing an irresponsible damage to the environment, which results in degrading the condition of this planet. By taking care of this planet, we can improve our well-being as a healthy environment will help in improving the quality of our life. It is our collective responsibility to raise public responsibility regarding the well-being of our mothers. We always keep in our heart, mind, and soul that this art is the only home we all have. And that is why it is highly important to take important measures to save this planet. It is time to part our way from planet harming activity and for all generations to live a healthier life. It is important to save our planet. People around the world should understand the need of a greener and cleaner planet. We all need to fulfill our responsibility and make ample effort to protect our mother earth from the harming activity. Therefore, it is our duty to change our behavior and learn to improve upon our actions towards the environment. One of the best ways to proactively take steps in the right direction is to become more environmentally conscious and to teach others how to become more environmentally aware as well by understanding what impact our actions have on the environment and behaving differently. We will help to save not only the planet but humanity as a whole. I feel that environmental awareness make us realize the pressing need to take immediate action to stop harming the environment and start restoring the damage we have done to it. Unless there is awareness, there is no action or at least no proper action. And this action must start from the individual level and spread through the people and organization. Once we have a thorough understanding of the environmental issues, such as deforestation, 
environmental pollution, water crisis, global warming and climate change, loss of biodiversity, etc. Every one of our actions will come out of a place of concern for our surrounding. Out of love for Mother Anita, out of the willingness to contribute towards sustainable development and make a positive change in our work. When we realize that the art is so much more than simply our environment, we will be moved to protect the heart in the same way as we would ourselves. This is the kind of emotion, the kind of awakening that we need, and the future of the planet depends on the way you we are able to participate in insight or not. The art and all spaces on earth are in a real danger. Yes, if we can develop a deep relationship with the art, we will have enough love, strength, and awakening in order to seek our way of love. And then we have to do good. Ampet. Taking part in environmental seminars, webinars, campaigns, and movements can help us to spread environmental awareness to save our mother earth. Under these circumstances, CTEF, a concept to a certain this topic for today's webinar. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Mandirana. Thank you, John Nabi, for that wonderful concept note for this webinar. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Archana Bhattacharji, Working Vice Chairperson, CTEF Assam, to formally introduce the respected speakers of this webinar. Over to you, Archana Bhattacharji. Okay, thank you, Mondira Bordloy. And so uh, very hearty good evening and welcome to everyone. Uh, I really feel honored and privileged to get this opportunity to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker and our esteemed speakers of today's webinar before the participants. So without wasting time, uh, let me start off with a keynote speaker. Now, Dr. Ram Bhus is an environment and sustainability professional with rich experience of over 40 years in diverse fields with the government, university system, civic society, and the United Nations. He is currently the CEO of the Mobius Foundation and is also the advising UNEP on Transboundary Landscape Initiative. He headed the ecology division of the UNESCO South Asia office in Delhi for over a decade and also convened the South and Central Asia MAB network. He has served as regional director of the Center for Environmental Education and assistant director of the Environment Ministry Government of Uttar Pradesh, India. Dr. Boj is involved with several prestigious universities, institutions as guest faculty visiting adjunct professor both in India and abroad. He is the co-founder of the World Ocean Network France and executive board member of Conservation for Oceans Foundation United, Nation, United States. He has published over 100 research papers and popular articles and 15 books and is also the recipient of many honors, awards and recognition, including the prestigious Science Academy Medal for Young Scientists from our late Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Our second resource person is Sri uh, Bibhav Kumar Talukdar. He is an MSc in Animal Ecology and Wildlife Biology and a PhD working in the field of wildlife research and conservation since 1989. He was one of the founders of Arunak in 1989, which is a premier NGO of Northeast India. Currently, he is the chief executive officer of Arunak. He's also the chair of 
Asian Rhino Specialist Group of International Union for Conservation of Nature since 2008. He is also the Senior Advisor to International Rhino Foundation for Asian Rhinos since June 2008. He has served as a member of the Standing Committee of National Board of Wildlife during 2008 to 2010, and also the National Board of Wildlife since 2008 to 2020. He is also a member of the State Board of Wildlife and has been involved in wildlife crime monitoring in Northeast India and also in Southeast Asia. He has published 65 research papers in journals of international and national repute and is also an Ashok Fellow. Our second, uh, sorry, our third resource person is Dr. Apurba Kumar Das. He has done his BSc from Doran College, Tejpur, and his master's and PhD from JNU, New Delhi. He has 20 years of teaching experience at a PG level in the Department of Environmental Science, Tejpur University. He teaches uh, climatology, metrology, earth's processes, natural hazards, geoinformatics, and physical hydrology. He has been engaged in researches in the broad domain of earth science. His specific research interest areas include hydro uh, geomorphology, riverine hazards, coupling study between hydro geomorphic processes and ecology, urban climate and atmospheric study. He's also a PhD guide and his research work has been published in many journals of international review. So that just about, this is an uh, overall uh, view of all our distinguished speakers today. And we are indeed proud to have you in our midst today. And we know that the participants will definitely uh, gain from all your uh, sharing experiences so now, without wasting time, I would like to invite Dr. Ram Vuj to take over. Thank you so much, uh, Archana ji. Uh, it's really a privilege and honor to be with you all. Uh, Professor Neelima Bhagavati, really grateful. And uh, of course, Mandira ji, uh, Biplav, Bipav Talukdar, Arenyak, I, I know them very well for a very long period. And uh, uh, Professor Das. So it's really a uh, right time to discuss about uh, issues related to environment and sustainability, uh, particularly Northeast India, which is a hot spot for uh, you name any environmental problem, whether it's climate change, biodiversity, uh, it's uh, most impacted. And my association also goes back to, I think, 80s, yes, uh, a long association with Northeast, uh, as I served in Northeastern Hill University for a very long period. And later on, during UNESCO also, we had many projects running in Northeast India. And currently, of course, with the transboundary landscape initiative that uh, we started along with UNEP and ECMOD, uh, Assam particularly, of course, RNEC was there in one of the meetings that two years back we had in Bhutan. And uh, of course, because of COVID, this is now stalled, but naturally a lot of issues are there to be discussed and some major projects are in the offline. I have a brief uh, presentation. Uh, so if uh, you can enable uh, screen sharing, then I can just share that. Uh, that will help. Uh, I think you need to enable this uh, screen sharing. Yeah, host it. Mm, have disabled it. I think Babun can uh, please uh, help him with the screen sharing. Babun? I think it's already enabled if you could look down in the bottom. Yeah, screen. yeah, now, now it is enabled, yes. Just now it has been enabled, no problem.
So this is the presentation. So let me begin with this uh, global risks landscape. Uh, World Economic Forum meets every year uh, in the beginning. So uh, you can see 2020 top five global risks all were environmental. Extreme weather, climate action, failure, uh, uh, this uh, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, all these means if you consider water crisis, all uh, five global risks were environmental, both in terms of likelihood as well as impact. 2021 again, of course, uh, world community thought that COVID will Definitely, of course, it overshadowed environmental concerns. Uh, but uh, again, you can see the top uh, among the five, four are environmental. Uh, COVID comes fifth, uh, fourth. But of course, risk-wise, uh, environmental risks were slightly uh, of lesser importance. So again, we have this climate change, biodiversity, and disasters. These are the top ranking. We just had COP26 in Glasgow. And uh, it's uh, basically a make or break for the planet. The summit was termed as most important. And world community was uh, touting it as the last chance to save the humanity, to save the planet. And uh, the irony was that Glasgow recorded hottest summer during COP26 when this was happening in Glasgow. Uh, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson described the goal of COP26 as coal, car, cash, and trees. And there have been some progress, like for the first time, countries agreed to accelerate efforts towards the phase down not phase out of coal power and fossil fuel subsidies. Set out carbon markets, carbon trading uh, mechanism has been some kind of agreement has been there. By next year, it will be operationalized. There is uh, not very sufficient, but there is some progress on climate finance. And of course, deforestation, there have been agreement and methane emission. These two were very important one. And many countries have committed to net zero emission goal by 2050, uh, India by 2070 and China by 2060, which will cover about 63% of global emissions. If all these measures are taken, that is uh, expected. Let me just talk about the latest IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It came out with its report in August this year. And uh, the report is very alarming. And it says that whatever changes in climate system are happening recently, they are very widespread, very fast, rapid, and very intensive, and unprecedented in thousands of years. So that, that's very alarming. Uh, similarly, some 200 medical journals, including Lancet, the most prestigious one, they call, they also did an analysis and called climate change the greatest threat to global public health. Uh, this threat is much more alarming than uh, the COVID one. That was the conclusion. Uh, this report also came in July. Devastating wildfire in Europe, Russia, and the US, a record shattering heat wave in Northwestern North America, and extreme and deadly floods in Germany and China. These all were signs. Net zero emission by 2050. That was the that is the goal, because that is the only chance for the humanity to cap the temperature rise by the end of this century to 1.5 degrees. And of course, it's an aspirational idea and does not actually reflect the required emission urgency. So it's uh, not 
mandatory by the uh, as china and india they have different goals this is very important like every country was required to submit nationally determined contribution that's their intent what they want to do so if you combine all those ndcs only 1% reduction in greenhouse gas is possible and we need almost 20 to 45% we have actually these commitments were for a period of 2030 and where we needed around 45 to 50% reduction so still lot of effort is needed that is why uh, during the glasgow cop it was announced that countries will revise their uh, ndcs they will have new and enhanced ambitions so let us hope that by next year when world community meets in uh, egypt there will be somal sake is the venue of cop 27 there is much progress net zero uh, emission concept came with the ipcc report of october 2018 because paris agreement wanted temperature rise to 2 degrees below 2 degrees but this 2018 report asked the countries to limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees because if you want to save the planet and all the emissions must become net zero by 2050 and uh, that is what is the target now and for the net zero all roads to successful global clean energy transition go via india india has become suddenly very very important in fact uh, in september uh, us climate envoy john kerry visited and requested india to rose, raise global climate ambition and speed india's clean energy transition and uh, of course uh the in uh, cop agreement on coal there was that phase out of coal in on the india's insistence particularly this wording was changed to phase out a uh, phase down not phase out so there are problems and uh, india wants finances and china wants level playing field particularly in respect of human rights and technology sanctions so these are some of the issues that cropped up during a cop but this is very important indian prime minister attended cop 26 in glasgow and he made this concept of panchamrit these five elements of india's climate ambition and uh, that will put india on accelerated track to raise their ndcs you can say a climate ambition the first one is non fossil fuel based energy capacity to 500 gigawatt earlier it was 400 now it has been raised to 500 and meet 50% of energy requirement from renewables by 2030 so this is again very important because we had 35% ambition so that ambition has again been raised reducing projected carbon emission by a billion tons that is also very very ambitious reducing carbon intensity to below 45% until 2030 and net zero by 2070 this is what panchamrit india offered to the world apart from that we have this international solar alliance where india project presented interconnected solar energy infrastructure where india will take the lead one sun one world one grid this is very very important and also india is going to help small island developing countries particularly they are very much vulnerable to climate change and to help their in resilient infrastructure india has also launched a national hydrogen mission because hydrogen is the energy source of future both uh, solar wind and all other renewables they have their own issues but hydrogen is going to become the energy for the future so india is going to become a global hub for green hydrogen lot of uh, agreements with the world many world 
uh, uh, these leaders in this hydrogen energy was done. India is also leading. It proposed the sustainable lifestyle, life, a lifestyle for environment. Particularly, of course, yoga has become suddenly very popular all over the world. But lot of other Ayurved, Ayush ministry, and all those they put up this whole uh, new concept of uh, life. And of course, India requested developed countries to raise their ambitions for climate finance. and easy transfer of technology carbon sequestration basically this is uh, again lot of issues are there but uh, net zero is based on how world community sequester carbon or absorb emissions through afforestation before mid century that is by 2050 and virtually all pathways laid out by ipcc to capture 12 bt co2 equivalent every year require huge deployment of the so called negative emission technologies after 2050 and latest international energy agency report on net zero proposes carbon capture of 4 gigaton by 2050 which is huge planting trees potential to remove between 40 and 100 gigatons which is too little and that too over a long period of time therefore neither it is realistic and only shifts focus away from actions to be taken to a distant future and in fact this is the concern of uh, most of the scientist because whatever uh, uh, measures the world community has proposed that is not going to help in near term and climate is a, an emergency situation we need to act swiftly and very fast uh this is a very interesting in fact uh, al gore is in convenient truth that make made the compelling case for global warming it won uh, the many awards including the oscar and others and uh, this uh, Al Gore is very active, and I work very closely with him. Uh, particularly, we are now trying to uh, help countries in uh, renewable energy transfer, means easy transition to energy, as and raising, bringing countries together through various uh, diplomatic and UN initiatives. Uh, this is also a very interesting slide uh, paris agreement when us was signed uh, this uh, john kerry who is uh, now the us envoy on climate change he signed the agreement ratified the convention holding her granddaughter because this is for the future generation similarly of course india's prakash jawadekar signed because whatever we do today is going to impact our future generations in a major way another area is uh, the biodiversity in fact uh, uh, northeast being the hottest part of biodiversity and natural resources this is very important china held this convention in october this year uh, online and this will be held uh in person in april again april may next year and uh, in fact china wants to be seen as the global leader in environment and biodiversity efforts that is very very important and global biodiversity framework for 2030 that is that will be agreed upon hopefully and uh, the uh, actually the 30 30 goal which says that 30% of land and coastal areas must be protected by 2030 so 30 by 30 goal uh, this was uh, initiated by us but now uh, the this cop in uh, beijing has adopted it of course indigenous and local communities and many ngos call this as a land grab because if you start protecting large areas 30% which is huge there will be uh, in uh, repercussions on local communities on their land 
and their lifestyle. So these are issues that will be discussed in next COP of biodiversity. IBES report, of course, this is very important. Uh, it's an intergovernmental panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And most important, this report, which came out in 2019, and which is, of course, the baseline for all the conservation efforts, it says that 1 million species, humans are driving to the extinction and agriculture is the biggest threats to ecosystems. So, and global response is insufficient. We need transformative action. Uh, and uh, of course this 30, 30, 30 uh, initiative is towards that uh, direction. Lot of efforts, in fact, throughout the year 2021 by many agencies observing because Corona has forced the world community towards nature. And that is where whole uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services come into forefront. And UN has also declared a decade of ecosystem restoration, 2021, 2030. This year on World Environment Day, this decade was launched. And uh, its uh, ecosystem restoration is a winning investment uh, if uh, countries invest one dollar and it will bring benefit or return to 10 to 15 times. That is uh, uh, what uh, uh, attracts this whole ecosystem restoration initiatives. And there are smart restoration plans uh, post COVID build back greener from COVID-19. And the next 10 years is going to be very, very crucial for the world community. Again, rest um, is your, uh, this today's webinar is so important, uh, connecting to the uh, whole global initiatives that is happening all over the world. World Environment Day, as I said, this ecosystem restoration decade was launched with the theme, reimagine, recreate, restore. And uh, this is a way to heal the nature and reversing damage caused by humans. Um, it's a go global mission to revive billions of hectares from forests to farmlands, from the top of mountains to the depth of the seas. These are right inside. These are some of the dangers that biodiversity and nature is facing today. In fact, uh, in all this debate, population debate is one which has attracted very little attention. You can just see how the world is growing. And uh, right now we are closer to 8 billion people on the earth, putting tremendous pressure on our resources. And of course, China is most populous, but India is going to overtake China in next, uh, maybe 2027, that is predicted. And uh, of course, a lot of debate is also going on how much pressure uh, you exert on worth, how many like footprint the uh, Australia have 5.2, that needs over five Earths, US five Earths. These are some of the countries. China needs 2.1 Earth, India half Earth, and total world 1.7. So even if you consider this whole population versus uh, nature, the whole debate, you need to balance it, to make it sustainable, uh, you have to do a lot. And uh, when I took over uh, this Mobius Foundation, I initiated one, one of the initiatives on this. These are some of the populous, most populous countries and how they, they're popular, like China will, this population is, getting reduced. India will also, like India will replace China in uh, around 2027, but by 2050, uh, there will be a very different situation. In fact, uh, Pakistan, Nigeria, Brazil, Indo uh, Indonesia, these all countries will take over many, means they will become most populous in the world. 
In fact, the, as I was mentioning, uh, we have started this mission sustainability population versus planet campaign. And this campaign is with Z network. And uh, in English, beyond, which is world is one. And in uh, Hindi and other regional languages, it is on the Z network. I have just brief two minutes. Let me just show you this. Uh, Uh, I'm sorry to ask, uh, but I can't hear the uh, audio. Is it same for everyone? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, we can't hear. Yes. So this is a, a year long campaign which is happening. And uh, of course, uh, uh, ecosystem restoration for people, nature and climate. And uh, of course, this is another campaign that we are combining with this uh, population versus plan, planet, joint generation restoration. Uh, as uh, Secretary General of the United Nations has in his message said, making peace with nature is the defining task of 21st century. It must be the top, top priority for everyone, everywhere. So naturally, we are at war with nature and we have to make peace with it and it should be the topmost priority. Uh, this is another very interesting message by Kathleen Rogers, president of Earth Day Network. She was in India uh, two years back and I had interacted with her. Scientists are sounding the alarm that unless we take better care of the planet, we risk more and even deadlier viruses ravaging our communities. So this is a warning in the context of COVID. So, uh, I think I have this one again. Uh, looking beyond the pandemic, in fact, uh, 50 years back, Earth Day, first Earth Day uh, in 1972, there was a quote, we have met the enemy and he is us. So this year's Earth Day, we realized that we cannot take the nature for granted. In fact, man is the sole enemy of the nature in, in a way. We cannot afford to lose space nor focus. The challenge of biodiversity and climate crisis will still be there when COVID-19 restrictions are lifted, as we see now. The ambition of COP15, COP26 must be carried forward and built upon in 2021. Of course, it's also going to end now. Economic recovery plans must be green. And of course, world has come out with certain ambitions uh, on climate change and need to uh, come out with similar ambition for biodiversity and nature as well. Uh, there is greater appreciation of nature now. Nature-based solutions are the key for sustainability on Earth. Nature-based solutions, NBS is one, I think, key word now it is everywhere. Looking ahead, there are opportunities emerging from this pandemic which if ceased could set the path for a more fruitful 2021. In fact, uh, in 2019, world community said 2020 will be a super year for nature and environment. Then they hoped that 2021 will be, but it was halfway done. And let us expect that 2022 will become the super year. Let us hope. And uh, hope is from the youth. And uh, we need some more such voices. As you can see, Greta Thunberg, uh, the Fridays for Future movement. Uh, Emi Lucas, 
She is running a campaign on sustainable lifestyles, uh, particularly sustainable vegan. And uh, Blue All is, uh, again, she is talking about uh, sustainability. And uh, of course, this Vanessa, she's also a global advocate on sustainability. We have in India our own uh, Lisipriya. And uh, of course, she made an opening speech uh, in the, this uh, alternate COP26 that was held and raised her voice. Uh, but uh, sensation was uh, this 15-year-old uh, Vinisha Umashankar. She was one of the finalists of Prince William's Earth Short Prize. And uh, she made a, a huge impact at Climate uh, Chasen Conference, COP26. And she said, she said that stop talking and start acting. Of course, uh, Greta's uh, this blah, blah, blah became the buzzword. And definitely this, these youth, they are making a lot of noises and a lot of right kind of initiatives. They say, as Greta was telling, means why should we not buy court classes? Because if we do not have future, Earth is going to be finished by these kind of devastations brought by climate change, biodiversity, and many, many disasters. And there is no future. So let us work for the future to make it better. So we need more such voices from the youth. And with this, I would stop it here. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, it is always a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, uh, you have very delicately expressed the hazards of climate change, and especially uh, the role that India has to play in uh, you know, how to march towards zero emission in future to save our planet Earth. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Bhuj. Now to move ahead, uh, it is time now to listen to Dr. Bibhav Kumar Talukdar, who will be speaking on the topic, environmental education and climate building. Over to you, Dr. Talukdar. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Bhuj, uh, you know, just stop the screen sharing so that I can start. Dr. Vuj, Dr. Yeah. Ram Vuj, will you kindly stop sharing your screen? I think I had. Ah, now, now it's gone. Now it's gone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there are problems, yes. <laughs> if you just not put the double click, it will not. I clicked just once, so it, it has not gone. It's okay. It's okay. It can happen. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much. And I will be basically focusing on the you know, environmental education and the capacity building, which is very much important. And... <clears throat> If we see, you know, means uh, the sustainable goals, because these are all things which are related. You know, earlier environmentalists thought that, you know, we will only concentrate on the environment and the development planners thought that we will only, you know, concentrate on the development. But if we re really need to, you know, make progress as a nation, we need to have, you know, a sustainable mindset in order to, you know, uh, achieve the sustainable uh, if we see these 17, you know, sustainable developmental goals, it has become a common responsibility of plus regions of, you know, of this planet Earth uh, to really, you know, uh, use our brains, use our efforts. Uh, so as to maintain the ecological uh, balances so that, you know, the ecosystems can contribute towards meeting 
you know, or uh, towards meeting our needs. Um, in, in that way, you know, we can achieve our sustainable development goals. And now, nowadays, in every state in, in India, you know, their progress are also measured, you know, with regards to the progress they made with these 17 goals. So this is an opportunity for teaching communities to really percolate down, you know, so that we can build the next generations which are more informed so that their decisions will be a balanced one and that could ensure that we exist on this planet Earth along with other life forms. So environment education, as we all know, is very important. But, you know, if we utter very complicated word, it's very difficult to understand. But the day-to-day, -day, you know, needs, you know, are basically coming from the ecosystems. For example, water, clean air, fertile soil, all these are being given by nature. If we need food, then that also comes from nature. So, you know, this is something that we cannot ignore nature and we all understand that. But I think the time has come that we need to make, to convert our understanding into some sort of action. And we have seen in the last, you know, 20 months, you know, we are almost like house arrest. You know, so much power that, you know, we thought that the, the species Homo sapiens have. You know, we have realized that, you know, the nature is more powerful. And for that, you know, we really, you know, need to inculcate in the minds of the young with regards to, you know, the, the, the need for environmental consciousness, how the nature works, how the forest works, how the other ecosystems works. And accordingly, you know, we nurture the mindset of the young students you know, so that they understand how, you know, this planet Earth is, has been surviving, is surviving and has to survive if we need to, you know, make or we need to march ahead, you know, in, on this planet Earth. And we have seen, you know, the different pathogens, different genotic diseases. They are... In fact, you know, the scope of you know, spreading more and more to human beings because of the deforestations. More deforestations we are doing, we are in fact inviting our own disasters. So for this all, you know, kind of the threats, some of the threats are visible at this moment. Some of the threats probably at this moment are not visible, but we need to anticipate. And I think this COVID-19 has you know, made us understand that this is time that we need to learn to live with nature and ensure that, you know, the future outbreak of any genetic diseases can be checked by our actions, you know, as early as possible. So the ecosystems plays an important role and I had you know, published a, a, a newspaper article recently, which I related that you know, the national security complements national security. Now, if a nation doesn't have a good biodiversity, good you know, process that support uh, the, the environment, I think the nations will face even more insecurity from different aspects. So these are related matters. I will also you know, talk a little bit about the wildlife crime. You know, where I have been involved with for many, many years. So notice is very important in the sense that this is an in important, you know, biogeographical locations. Uh, we have flood plains where with little rain, we get, we get, you know, flooded. And when we also have high altitude mountains where we have snow capped mountains. So for these reasons, you know, we need to plan differently, perhaps compared to the rest of India. Because of these altitudinal gradients, we have diversity of flora and fauna. We have big animals like elephants. And if we study the behavior of elephants, sometimes I feel they are more intelligent than humans. So these are you know, the, the, the knowledge that we need to uh, you know, unearth or further expedite you know, our understanding about how the nature works. 
elephants are big animals. They themselves knows that they cannot spend, you know, cannot stay in the smaller forest for you forever. So that's why they are nomad. They move from one place to another. And by probably six months times or eight months times when they again come back to their, to their original place, you know, the regeneration takes place. And now what we humans are doing or trying to, you know, address this human elephant conflict, we are trying to restrict them in smaller pockets. We are trying to make a fence so that elephants cannot come without understanding, you know, their ecological needs. So that is where I think the understandings are very important. The deforestations in Assam is in, in certain parts are well documented. And the technology like the GIS technology has made it crystal clear. I think for the decision makers, just one minute is good enough to understand the situation in Gulagat district. You can see the satellite imageries of 1974 on the left, in the middle in 1991, and 2004 on the extreme right. And the amount of forest that has been destroyed there is significant. And these are some of the districts in Assam where human wildlife conflicts are increasing. These are man-induced problems, and we have to, you know, you know, find out the solutions. And there are casualties on both sides. The vultures, they are the clean municipality corporation. You know, they clean the environment without charging any fees, any taxes on us. So these are the free services that we need to nurture so that, you know, we can keep our environment clean. There are other species like the greater adjutant stock. In Assamese, we call it hargil. They are also cleaning you know, the environment. And we can see them in the garbage uh, you know, dumps, even in near Guwahat city. Now, how you know, the, the landscape planning is very important. Now, we are, everybody is talking about Kaziranga, Kaziranga, Kaziranga. You know, we cry you know, when flood hits Kaziranga. But how much we understood the total landscape ecology? The future of Kajiranga depends on the future of this Karbianglong hills. If the Karbianglong hills that faces Kajiranga is not properly preserved or conserved, the future of Kajiranga will be in jeopardy. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, a flat is a you know, detrimental uh, you know, for, for Kajiranga or for rhinos. I don't believe so. Flat is a natural phenomenon. The rhinos have been living in these flat plains for years. In 1966, when the first rhino estimations took place in Kaziranga, the population was 366. Every year, flood comes. Despite that, the rhino population has now increased in Kaziranga to 2,400. So that data clearly says that, you know, that natural flood, although it wipes out few populations, but that is called the natural selections. The flood takes away the weaker animals and keeps the strongest animals so that we can get the stronger offspring. So these are the, you know, the, the knowledge that we need to understand and accordingly guide our government. And nowadays the media focuses the Kajinonga flat in such a way that government thought probably let us make Kajinonga like a hill so that there will be no flood. But the species which are found in Kajinonga are basically flat plain species. That means they are highly you know, the, the, the grassland habitat or the flat plains habitats are, are suitable. But, you know, that is where, again, the sensitization of medias are also important. And all these things can be done in the educational systems. Now, as, you know, we have seen the developmental pressures, this is the, you know, the map of Kajiranga during 1990s and 2010. You can see along the highways, there are, you know, gaps that means the, 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 the continuity of forest cover with Kajinonga in many places are lost. We all realize that we may not be able to restore all of them, but we need a good planning, you know, because just emotion cannot save Kajinonga. To save Kajinonga, we need to integrate the ecological understanding and the feasibility where, you know, the habitats can be, remain undisturbed. The habitat loss is an important, you know, uh, threat, is, is, is a key threat, you know, for some of the species population decline. Some of the populations, because the habitat fragmentations, it has become isolated populations and they have no hope. 
that same scenario happens for Sumatran rhino, which were earlier found in Malaysia. The forest defragmentation started. There are a small population here and there. And by you know, 2017, most of the Sumatran rhino population from Malaysia is extinct. So only species, only the Sumatran rhinos now found in Indonesia, but the same trait we have seen. Now, even in you know, the, the forest cover, why we need forest cover? In a place like Guwahati, where we live, you know, as monsoon comes, you know, our blood pressure increases. Because we think we know that which road to avoid. Earlier, you know, the Jew Road is one of the you know flooded areas during the flash flood. Of course, the GNB Road. But now I stay, I, I, I stay in survey area to cross wireless, you know, is a, is a is an issue because the new flash flood has stuck new areas in Guwahati city. So these are the you know so-called examples of ecological. Uh, you know, the damage caused to the forest and the ecosystems and the consequences that we are facing. So for that, I think we really need to sensitize the students uh, so, and trigger some actions. I always say that, you know, just doing research on wildlife, on forests doesn't actually contribute much unless until that triggers some actions or reactions. Wetlands are an important, you know, you know, ecosystems which are often treated as wasteland. I have just seen, you know, in, in newspapers a few days back that Assam's flood problem will be solved by creating ponds or by preserving ponds in Assam. I think that is something the sensible things that government of India has thought. That is what we need to promote. We have seen during pandemic the wildlife is at intellism. In the heart of the city, we have a wetland called Digali Pukuri, which is close to High Court. And after at least 20 years, I have been doing birding for almost you know, 30 years. After 20 years, we have seen this whistling duck came to the busiest city because during that time, nobody was around on the street because of the COVID restriction. We have seen because of COVID, even the sky getting clearer. Okay. And that is what, you know, we all slowly started realizing, and as Dr. Ram Bhuj also mentioned in, in one of his uh, you know, slides, that humans is one of the major threat to the environment. The wildlife crime, the Northeast is having diverse like, you know, wildlife, and some of them are credible. Like rhinos are killed for its horn, tigers are killed for its skins, bones, uh, the elephants for ivories. So there is a growing market. And because we have porous borders with South and Southeast Asia, the Northeast has been used by the wildlife traders, you know, as a transit route. And wildlife trade is the fourth largest illegal trade in the world. Not only that the big animals are being slaughtered, even, you know, the snakes are, are being killed. What they make from the, you know, snake skins are basically, you know, the bag, shoes. So if we can sensitize people not to buy, we can save these animals. There are bird trade going on in different parts of India. Of course, it has reduced. Now the gecko, the little awareness with regards to the brush that you know, most of us, we use. We never ask from where these brushes are being made. If you see these brushes, which I have shown, these brushes are made by killing mongoose. So if we are aware, if we don't buy these kind of brushes, we can save mongoose. Because this is the only place where we have been living, we are living, and we have to live. There is no other, no other options as of now. So for that, we need to create more awareness. I, with my experience, you know, being, you know, running the Aranak NGO for over thirty years, I have seen growing, you know, uh, awareness among among the section of people. But I think we need to do more. And in the field of environment wildlife, forestry, we need to encourage students to go out. If we never go out, we'll never know. So that's something, a message that we need to, we learn many things when we go into the field. You know, from the bookish knowledge, you know, the ecology, environment, wildlife, forestry is very difficult to understand. So that's something we need to encourage our students, you know, to spend time, learn about how the nature works, 
and then integrate into their day-to-day -day thought process, you know, in order to contribute towards the sustainable uh, development you know, that would ensure the conservation of the ecosystems and also, you know, reduce the impact of climate changes. What we really need is to make our mindset that we are going to contribute to achieve green and clean environment. That mindset is very important. And for that, we have to care and we have to share. Um, as I have been you know, speaking about that, you know, students are our important target audiences. And every year, you know, we get new and new batches of students. So somewhere I think we need to work more the new educational you know, policy and all other things, you know, we need to uh, prioritize the need to, to incorporate environmental contents so that you know, we make our future generation environmentally conscious and our developmental planners are more equipped with ecological and ecosystem-based knowledge to plan the developmental activities which will be least damaging to the environment. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Vibhag and uh, Kumar Talukdar for reiterating on the importance of preserving our environment for the protection of mankind and for showing us the various ways how we can develop sustainable goals. You have pointed out how the wildlife is at threat with the decrease of their habitat due to deforestation. Yes. Um, as you say, the students, the youth, and especially the media need to be sensitized regarding the myths and the facts. Thank you so much, Dr. Talukdar. It was a very valuable presentation. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Professor Apurba Kumar Das, who shall be giving a presentation on environmental degradation, a threat to the survival of living beings. Over to Professor Das. Thank you, uh, Madam. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Nilima Bhagavati for a very kind introduction. Uh, actually, I do not know. <laughs> I'm much more embarrassed than uh, than being happy about my introduction. But nevertheless, I'm very thankful to you and also to Dr. Dian Das having a positive words for me. Uh, uh, I can understand that uh, this liberal seasoning of uh, praises is because of her own eminence uh, only. That is probably she sees and others also in the same line. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, for this. So uh, coming uh, formally uh, to the uh, to the speak uh, uh, to the to the talk that I'm talking about, uh, Professor Nilma Bhagavati, International Secretary uh, General of CTEF and Chairman of CTEF Assam. Uh, Dr. Boj, uh, I'm very happy to you know share because I'm a small fry in front of him, uh, but I'm very happy to share the same platform uh, 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 then uh, Dr. Vibhav Talukta, CEO of RNAP, uh, uh, an organization uh, well known throughout, not only in Assam, through other parts of our country as well. Uh, Dr. Pranjit Kumar Sarma uh, from Mongolia College uh, and the other participants, there are very few. Uh, I don't mind to hold my, uh, I don't uh, don't mind to say it is a bit of a disappointment. I was expecting there will be younger uh, colleagues from colleges and uh, students and participants. My disappointment is not because of organizers point of view, because I prepared whatever I thought I would speak about is mainly targeting at those younger minds. Mm, but never Don, uh, uh, I would just like to interrupt here and tell you, uh, uh, you see less participants here because we have not per permitted everyone to join here. They are watching yes. over YouTube. Okay. Because of some, uh, because of some technical hitch that we faced earlier, uh, we decided fine. we decided to do this. So That's there are many people watching you now. 
Sure, that boosts me. Definitely, that boosts me. Thank you very much for the information. And in my colleagues, uh, participant colleagues in the platform. Uh, as I said, I'm very thankful to the organizer for this opportunity to speak to you. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this morning I spoke to Nilima Baido once again. Uh, see, uh, I, I told her that, ma'am, I'm not coming with any presentation uh, per se or for the sake of it, um, particularly with full of information about the what are the degradations taking place, where degradation, because I know. Uh, it's not very difficult for any one of us to find out at a click of a mouse about the whole array of uh, problems that we face and when we face. So as a uh, teacher uh, who teaches in an PG level, I thought I should be doing what I best do in any class is to touch upon something very fundamental, uh, I felt is a fundamental. So what is it? Like? Actually, while thinking about the environmental issue, uh, I more often than not face with a fundamental question. I call it a fundamental, but I would not really force you to think it as a not fundamental, but definitely I propose it as a fundamental question that arises very naturally, not, not just in my mind. I'm, I'm sure any rational being, uh, any with, with bit of philosophy uh, would definitely arise these uh, questions, fundamental questions. So it is my intention uh, uh, to ruminate about uh, these questions, which I believe is interface of social psychology and environment studies. By doing so, uh, I hope to get answers rather than answering myself. This is a caveat I must say, uh, because I don't come from uh, some of the disciplines that I would be touching. Well, I was expecting that there will be a wide range of uh, faculty members from uh, colleges and although they cannot interact, I'm sure uh, will be there who will be helping me to find out some answers to uh, this question that arises more often than not into my mind. The core of my questions goes like this, that the environmental degradations and destructions uh, are very well known to all. Now it is not only confined to those scientists uh, some, some 50 years back or 30 years back. It is very well known to all. I mean to say the whole humanities, I mean to say. So the destruction uh, or you call it and degradations are well known to the world. And the sort of actions uh, that we ought to be doing for mitigating these destructions are also well known to the human being. But yet, the problem, yet we are not doing enough, why is it that? So we face, this, that we face a situation whereby that we know it, but where we are not able to do it. It's a fundamental questions uh, I always often face myself with, that why in spite of knowing what is happening, in spite of knowing what we should be doing, in spite of knowing that why uh, the mechanism, the science, the impact, everything we know it, but yet we are not able to uh, do enough uh, to arrest the degradations or or address the uh, challenges of the uh, challenges of the environment, just like climate climate change, etc. So, uh, is this a situation? Uh, therefore, that is it an irony that has no solutions that we know it, but we are not able to. Do it. it is irony, or it's a paradox, if I may be allowed to use in the platform. Is this a paradox whereby uh, that we we find that there is no solutions? and thereby we are destined to be doomed as a human race. In this, uh, I would like to mention one thing that we more often than not commit a mistake that human being is in danger or the art, art is in danger. Uh, I once came across one quote by one of the uh, one, uh, one uh, renowned man, but I forgot his name. Uh, he rightly said that Actually, it is not the art who is in danger. It is the human race that is in danger. Art is resilient. It will strike back in some form or the other. Now, coming back uh, to my inquisitiveness about that, is this a situation or is this a paradox that has no solutions and thereby we are destined to be doomed? Then another query that comes to my mind that is there a situation uh, in the natural realm uh, which is a parallel to this situation. What is the situation? To be very frank, we, we faced with a situation whereby 
uh, we faced with a situation uh, whereby uh, yeah, the situation goes like this, uh, that uh, we know it. It means, I mean to say, the distractions we are doing it. We should and we can do it. That is, I mean to say about the mitigation. Then we wish, everyone wishes to have a, a healthy art. So we know it. We can and we should be doing it. We wish that we have it, but yet we are not doing it. Is there any other examples or parallels in the scientific realms? And I'm sure there is. Uh, there are very uh, there are parallels in the socioeconomic realms. But I was trying to look at: is there any? Uh, because I just trying to want to see that is it a natural uh, natural law that everyone will be doing it and finally will be destined to be doomed? Is there a natural law? I was trying to explore it. So in my effort uh, to find out these answers, uh, there are three concepts or jargons, I would say, uh, from different uh, disciplines. One mainly from the uh, physical science or natural science disciplines, another from socioeconomic and uh, human psychological disciplines. Three concepts are of special interest to us. These concepts are entropy, tragedy of commons, and enlightened self-interest. And as of now, I would call it only tragedy of, uh, uh, I would like to call it a tragedy of uh, unregulated common uh, or, and the enlightened self. These three concepts are of, uh, I find are of very interest or should, uh, should throw some light about uh, my, uh, my effort in finding up the answers or the dilemma or what I call it irony. So uh, coming to the first concept is tragedy of common. It is a concept of a physical science. We all know in thermodynamics, uh, there's a concept called, uh, uh, scientific concept called entropy. And uh, this concept relates to energy and energy waste and, and measurable energies. Not going to the typical definitions of thermodynamics uh, for the sake of everyone's uh, appreciations. We can think about uh, the definition of entropy this way, that it is a physical property that is most commonly associated with a state of disorder. That's what's very important, these few words. It is commonly associated with state of disorder, randomness, or uncertainty. So uh, in the simplest word that uh, uh, in the second law of thermodynamics says, which we all should be able to appreciate irrespective of the discipline that we come from, the state of uh, the thermodynamics, the law of thermodynamics is the state, there's a natural tendency of a system, that system, be it my own mind, be it a larger system, but be it a social system, any system we can, uh, we can understand the facets. So there's a natural tendency of a system to degenerate into a more disordered state. So uh, to put it in a simpler word, being disorderly is natural. That is natural tendency of the molecule cell. Just to cite a small example that, that given the chance, uh, the water molecule will not like to be organized and stay together, look like water. And given the chance, they will, they, they will move away from each other and move around into the death. Uh, another small example, so you can find it about the smoke uh, or when we light uh, this incense tea. Uh, sticks, uh, what we call agarbati, we, we burn, then we should see those smokes and slowly, slowly they disperse. They don't like to be organized, they like to be together. That's the entropy. So there is a natural tendency uh, in, the, in the nature to be disorderly. So disorderly, disorderly is norm, then be orderly. Then that, that, that brings to us certain very interesting things that can disorderly be a uh, be in uh, sort of uh, uh, be a sort of desired state? The answer is difficult. There may be exceptions, but question uh, the answer is no. In the sense that in a society uh, we cannot be disorderly, uh, or even in my own life also I cannot be disorderly for a better life. Uh, that's what the you know, all the spirit of life, uh, uh, you know, the good habit of life tells us to be orderly. Even in economics also, we need just to be orderly. In political uh, life also, we needed to be orderly. Now, therefore, 
we face with a situation that it is a natural tendency to be disorderly, but at the same time, if we need it to be orderly, then what is the way out? We know from our own examples that to be orderly, we have to apply energy. For example, those water molecules, to put them into an orderly, those water gaseous molecules, that water vapor, to put them into an orderly, or put them into a more orderly in an uh, ice form or it is frozen form, we have to apply energy. So this energy that we will apply in social system, if we can understand, it is in that this is the discipline or this is an effort that is required to bring everything into order. Now, uh, the meaning of the entropy in social context is uh, often very not very clear and it is obscure, but the concept is, is of significance for the understanding of the order of disintegration or the magnitude of the distribution of the systems. And in this case, I'm talking about the entire environment in as in systems. So uh, if we if we bring about the context uh, concept of entropy to the understanding of the whole of whole activities of the human being. Uh, that disintegrates the uh, ecosystem, disintegrates the environment as a whole system. They probably entropy has an interesting, you know, um, interesting tool to look at it. That uh, why do we disintegrate? This is not to say that it is quite natural to disintegrate is quite natural, but is, this is not also to reject that it is unnatural. So human philosophy. Uh, whether at an individual level, individual level or the community level. This community level may be in corporate, maybe a state, maybe in society or at, at any level has a natural tendency probably to be disorderly. Uh, I'm not claiming, I do not know. As I said, I'm not from those uh, disciplines, uh, particularly not from, uh, from uh, social psychology disciplines, but I was expecting that there will be people to help me out uh, in this regard. I was expecting that we can probably uh, speak better or we can be more meaningful uh, by, by participation of the others into my discussion. But nevertheless, that's how I understand that entropy is there uh, to be disorderly tendency is to be there. Uh, whether it is because of our benefit or because of whatever reasons we, we try to be disorderly. Then the second concept I thought, uh, ma'am, I hope I don't want to oversuit the time uh, because I don't want to put the organizers into trouble to go much exceeding the time. Time, uh, I'm sure I will keep a uh, tab on my uh, time. The third, uh, the second concept I brought, I thought is the importance to us is the tragedy of commons. Now, uh, tragedy of commons uh, focuses on the conflict uh, between the individuals and collective rationality. Now, I'm sure uh, almost all the participants uh, in this group has the uh, idea of this uh, great essay uh, that was published by Garrett Heading uh, in, in the 60s in the, uh, in the ultimate journal uh, in, called Science, uh, in the scientific disciplines, the sciences, uh, this journal called Science is highly regarded journal, probably one of the most uh, the most uh, prestigious journal considers to be. So uh, this concept of tragedy of common is, although he's not original, but he was the one who popularized the concept of tragedy of commons. Now this tragedy of commons in the original as well as in, in his uh, uh, own, uh, in the uh, Garrett Heading's uh, essay, this tragedy of commons can be very briefly understood to be like this, that uh, those uh, like this, uh, that the uh, that uh, that a rancher uh, or uh, ranchers, uh, there is the same example he has used. Uh, the ranchers who who use a common ranch land for their uh, cattle. Uh, for their own benefit, they would think they know it very well that if it is overgrazed. There, that land will be destroyed. But yet, I, as a rational being, I, as a rancher, I would think that is a common problem. But if I add one more cow into my rancher, I will be benefited. So uh, this is a problem of uh, whether I should uh, I should think of my of my individual benefit or I should think about my uh, 
uh, uh, my collective responsibility. So human being always face with human being, whether individually or society or corporate or state, always face with this dilemma of uh, individual uh, individual uh, uh, interest and the uh, 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 in this case, individual may be a person, may be an industry, may be a farmer, or even a state. And individuals has access to the shared resources and act in their own interest, leading to degradations. So these examples are everywhere. For example, uh, if I am a Guanti dweller, throwing my garbage into a, in a road will probably uh, will benefit me because my house will be free of this thing. But my common, the road, the air, this all will be uh, suffering. But then I would benefit. I would think that my own individual benefit is much more beneficial than the common beneficiaries. The third concept I brought in, uh, the third concept that uh, I thought will be beneficial uh, will be uh, the enlightened self-interest. Uh, it refers to the behavior. Uh, if a person act in public interest, uh, is eventually in the interest ultimately served in their own self. Uh, recently, uh, the UN Secretary General also, uh, after visiting uh, uh, many, many places, has uh, invited the entire world community the, to act, uh, what is he call it, an, as an enlightened self-interest. This enlightened self-interest goes like this, that uh, goes like this, that uh, I as a rational human being, uh, if, I, if I act for the benefit of the others, the benefit comes to me. In this case, the benefit of the commons I'm trying to say. If I act for the benefit of the commons, I suppose the benefit will come to me. So these all three uh, things when I collectively see uh, is that, uh, then what is it that finally I find that why is it so hard for people to act on the environmental problem? We know it, the scientists know it, we know the degradation, we know the extent, we know the mechanism why it is happening, we know the science, we know the way out, we know the activities what we should be doing it. If everyone agrees it, no one disagrees about the uh, reality and existence of the threat, reality and existence of the uh, uh, of the different environmental problems, for example, those four big environmental problems, biodiversity, climate change, pollutions, and uh, drinking water. Everyone knows it, no one rejects it. Why what is so difficult to act, uh, hard to get people to act together or act on the environmental problem, be it at individual level or be it at highest level of the organization that is in international or national or state level. Answer is very difficult. I said, uh, I, I'm not, I have not, I haven't had any research on this regard, except my own natural rationality of whatever little rationality I can construct into my mind. So therefore I cannot have a concrete answer, but I can very well safely speculate that it is combinations of both the dilemma of the individuals and collective rationality, that is the dilemma of the common and the trade-off between the short-term benefit and the long-term benefit. And this trade-off is a very, very hard trade-off to achieve. For a human being, uh, short-term benefit and or long-term benefit is no big deal, but because I know if I, if I grow more foods, uh, more food, uh, just now two of my uh, uh, previous, uh, uh, previous speakers spoke about that how agriculture is uh, one of the main uh, drivers of the uh, degradations in environment. But then through agriculture, we benefit. Uh, we benefit uh, at individual level, at uh, society level. So therefore we face this dilemma of trade-off that should we look at this short-term benefit and then long-term benefit. So this trade-off is very hard to achieve. There are long difficult reality. It's a very complex reality right from economics to the individual rights to the human rights. These are all interconnected reality are there. So I, I cannot say the answer, but the speculation, uh, I can safely answer that the answer to the question, the why it is so hard uh, to bring people to act on the environmental problems is, the, uh, is that it is the combination of the both dilemma of the individual and the collective rationality that is tragedy of commons and the trade-off between the short-term uh, short and uh, long-term benefits. 
Before I finish, I would also like to say uh, I, I'm, I'm being a little abstract in my conclusion. Uh, that is, I'm being a little abstract in my conclusion, purposely, because I, as I said, my intention, whole in my intention is to uh, is to is to force the younger faculty members I have with me in this participation uh, to think about, to ponder about, to ruminate about. Uh, about the, the simple questions that arises in my mind, and I'm suppose it arises in everyone's minds that we know it, but what we cannot do it. What is it? Is it something natural? Is it something bound to happen? Then, before I finish, uh, I would like to uh, uh, just uh, mention two small uh, points. Uh, this not really connected to the questions that I say. Is that what does awareness do? Awareness campaign, uh, because uh, as I could see, this is an effort. This whole webinar is an effort of an awareness campaign, and uh, Dr. Bibob uh, Talukdar also, you know, highlighted about the awareness, and so does uh, uh, Dr. Rambuj. Uh, I was looking at uh, just as just as I was looking at trying to look at the philosophy, uh, philosophically, the problem of this uh, tragedy of common or problem of this paradox of this environment or irony of the environment. I was looking at that, what is it probably awareness campaign would serve? Then, uh, then I came across, uh, I came across a paper, I'm, I'm very sorry to say I forgot it, but if necessary, sometimes I give it. I came across a research paper uh, where it is, it is clearly felt that, you know, Awareness campaign, uh, it is somehow linked to my uh, ultimate idea that actually until and unless it becomes an immediate threat to the human being, human being keep postponing all these things. For example, uh, my immediate threat is my food, my immediate threat is my job, my immediate threat is my livelihood, my immediate threat is my help of my health, health of my uh, family, my immediate threat is this. Uh, uh, so therefore, I, I tend to forget. The same thing happens with earthquake. For example, we know Northeast India is an earthquake-prone state uh, regions, but yet we do not construct our building in an earthquake, uh, earthquake way. That's basically because we know that having a roof on my head, head of my family, is much more immediate concern than thinking about the earthquake, which may or may not take place. We may or may not this, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of harm me. The same way, the immediate, uh, if it becomes an immediate concern, then people probably become uh, more proactive to this concern. Same way, more awareness, what does it do? That it becomes a janmat uh, in Hindi with, or whatever Sanskrit or Hebrew. it becomes a janmat, it becomes the opinion of the mass. Only when it becomes of the opinions of the mass, the urgency that the international agencies and the urgency that scientists are probably talking about will be there probably if only and only it becomes the opinion of the mass, not confined to few academics or not confined to few scientists. So with this, I once again, uh, you know, uh, uh, express my gratitude to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak to my own colleagues. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you, Professor Apurbo Kumar Das. Uh, you have wonderfully, you know, you have pointed out various aspects of environmental degradation. Uh, when you were talking about entropy, you know, I remembered uh, poem that we studied when we were in junior classes, which was the, the title of which was a delight in disorder, how there can be delight in disorder. And you know, it was really very interesting. So today I'm really reminded of that poem somehow. And yes, you have spoken about uh, uh, the thermodynamics. And uh, as I have found out that the second law of thermodynamics also say that uh, entropy always increases with time. So that is very interesting to find out. It always increases. <laughs> otherwise, it, otherwise, it is instable, madam. Yes. Otherwise, it is instable. The system is instable otherwise. Yeah. 
and you have also spoken about the human philosophy uh, in the community level and uh, you were hoping to find you know others who would discuss this matter with you but we really feel that human psychology is really diverse and therefore maybe there is some you know disorder in our society because of this varied you know diversity of our psychology nature of human beings uh then you have also touched upon the tragedy of commons that was interesting uh, that is a kind of you know the in problem in economics that occurs when individuals neglect the well-being of the society in the pursuit of their personal gain yes. the prisoner uh, 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 prisoner's dilemma yes but ultimately it leads to depletion of uh, common resources and finally yes uh, uh, you have also spoken about the uh, enlightened self interest which is you know it feels like a philosophy of ethics which uh, uh, the state of persons who act to further the interest of others uh, which is ultimately to serve their own self interest but so your talk was really very interesting and i hope there will be some questions uh, from the participants and thank you so much for being with us today it's dr. my pleasure ma'am dr taluk yes dr apurva kumar das uh, now uh, to move on with the agenda it is time for some short interactive session with all the resource persons the participants may now ask questions to the specific resource persons and please mention who the question is addressed to so that the respective resource persons may take the questions i also request dr archana bhatcharji to assist me in getting the questions from the chat box so that we do not miss any question But, so now uh, actually actually mandir uh, the problem is that we yeah. have only countable participants here with us now almost yeah. majority are watching on youtube or facebook live stream okay so uh, i don't know i don't know uh, if uh, anyone who are present here would like to raise uh, uh, any of their doubts or queries for any one of the resource person but it would have been nice yes uh to have included all but again due to the technical hitch we yeah. had to take these steps from yeah. previous experiences yeah. but uh if after listening on youtube or facebook live stream if our ctf like members have any questions for you uh we will uh, encourage them to you know place their questions in the group in a group page and we'll forward it to you not just to you but to the other resource persons also and uh, i hope you won't mind because uh, somehow or the other that part slipped our mind you know like during the interactions we'll be needing more participants you know to no come up with their views the queries or whatever uh, now amongst us there are few uh, so if anybody has any any question uh nilima ma'am if you have anything any observations to make yes. or others also the most welcome ma'am you are muted ma'am you are muted oh, yeah. yes exactly okay uh thank you archana indeed it was a very interesting and enriching session we learned a lot we learned a lot from all the resource persons uh now the same thing also you know something it ponders in a mind like coming as i am from the field of education and psychology like in the national education policy the more and more suggestions are being requested to send it to the mhrd about the you know upgrading the curriculum school curriculum etc etc but the thing which i have seen that not very much of focus on environmental do environmental education is there it is i won't say that there is no but the practical the practical side unless and until you give exposure to the students to see and learn certain things as dr bivak talukdar has also very rightly pointed out the exposure which they have to cover even dr rambuch and even our uh, professor das has also said so this is something important to do the massive awareness 
in fact, they don't know. Like when the earthquake comes, they simply, you know, like shout and cry, whether the parents or the children, they don't know what is happening. Even in Gohati, Dr. Vivavya said, Gohati, the flood, we are facing it for years and years and years. There is no outcome. There is no solution. About Kajiranga, everybody talks about Kajiranga, Kajiranga, but today we have learned the reality that what is happening. So these are some of the, you know, awareness which we should throw light while meeting the students, either in the institutions or either in some social gatherings. Because the more we can create, that will be best. Either it is the NGO, like they are doing, Arendak is doing, either it is our organization, CTF. In fact, we are now, when I'm hearing you, I'm thinking that this platform, which all of you have spoken so nicely, I will take it to the schools now. I will take it to the schools and colleges now because we want to sort of aware the present generation what is happening. The present generation is more in threat is to say. So this is exactly why listening, you know, I was feeling in my mind and my heart that we have to be now very careful and we have to be aware about our future of our children, not our children, but all the children around. So this is what, and definitely from city of Assam, I promise you, I will take you to the schools and colleges to the institutions to make it more reachable to all the students, to make it more reachable to the students and to get aware. Even out of 10, even say four get away, that is, I think that will be quite a good thing for us. So this is what is my feeling after hearing this wonderful session. And I thank you all the resource persons for enlightening us with so much of data, so much of facts, and so much of you know, thinking the insightful mind, we should you know, question ourselves that what is happening, we are not, why we are not doing anything and how we can do. So this was my observation, in fact, Archana. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. In fact, being a teacher, uh, I also often think about it. But as uh, Dr. Das has uh, just pointed out, sometimes what happens, you know, we give more importance to things which matter to us immediately. Yes. And That's we it. prioritize, we prioritize and put those things in front and other things which have actually... Uh, more impact in the future, we make it secondary. So that is where lies a problem. Problem, And we procrastinate, you know, we put off things. We'll do it later. We'll do it later because it is not uh, disastrous at this point of time. And another thing, another thing which I personally feel and I have seen that yes, environment was included in the school curriculum in the college and the high secondary level also. Uh, as a subject to create awareness. Uh -huh. Well, it was okay at that point of time. That was just the beginning. But later on, uh, they should have added more to it to make it slightly different because the first step was the creating of the awareness. Later on, they should have included a practical part in which the students are expected to go out, go out to the community, go out to the grassroots. So this practical part would have actually aroused the interest when they see things in person, instead of just reading the books and, uh, you know, collecting a lot of theoretical jargon, it would be more fruitful when they are actually in the fields, observing, learning, and that has a greater impact. So this is the need of the hour. If we have to start at the school level, I'm sure the NEP uh, is going to give more importance to that. We are hoping but at the same time, the responsibility lies with us teachers also. And as Nilima ma'am has so rightly pointed out that, yes, all of us can take over that responsibility in our own way, in whatever capacity we can, in our own area. We need to create awareness. And as teachers, we take that message to the schools and from the schools to the college, to the university, to the society or wherever possible. So in that way, at least some change, some transformation will be brought about. And we need to give importance to that, make it our first priority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the resource person. We are indeed, we are indeed lucky to have all of you with us today. 
and i don't know about others my i personally feel i have learned a lot you have given me plenty of food for thought and i'm sure the others have done too and they will be definitely you know sharing their insights with us the ctf live members will be sharing their insight with us in a group page and we'll try to pass on the queries if any to you over email thank you thank you once again thank you very much thank, thank you so you. much okay now on that interesting note uh, we'd like to wind up today's webinar and now i request dr tribeni saikya assistant secretary ctef assam to propose the words of gratitude over to tribeni saikya Yes, please unmute. Please unmute. Yes. Namaskar. A very good evening to one and all present in the platform, Professor Nilima Bhagavati, Madam, our uh, distinguished resource persons, uh, Dr. Ram Bose, sir, Dr. Bivas Kumar Talukdar, sir, Dr. Apurva Kumar Das, sir, and all the dignitaries present in the platform. First of all, I would like to. Uh, offer my thankful gratitude to Professor Nilva Bhagavati, Madam Chairperson, uh, CTEF Assam and International Secretary General, CTEF, for giving a warm welcome speech and also introducing the concept of CTEF in front of uh, the members of the webinar. Then I would like to offer my thankful gratitude to Dr. Jahnobi Lohkar. Borua uh, Madam, Secretary CTEF for speaking about the concept note about the main theme of the webinar. After that, I would like to offer my thankful gratitude to Archana Bhagavati uh, Madam, Bhattacharji Madam, sorry, Bhattacharji Madam for uh, formally introducing the distinguished speakers. Then uh, I would like to take the opportunity for offering my thankful gratitude to Dr. Ram Bose, sir, for uh, discussing the issues related to in environmental degradation and environmental upliftment. After that, I would like to offer my thankful gratitude to uh, Dr. Bivas Kumar Talukdar, sir, for uh, giving us uh, an enlightening uh, discussion about the sustainable goals sustainable mindset, maintain, uh, ecolo maintaining ecological balance uh, on importance on environmental education, etc. After that, I would like to offer my uh, gratitude to uh, Dr. Apurva Kumar Das, sir, for enlightening us uh, on the gap between to know and to do the tragedy of commons enlightened self-interest, dilemma between short-term and long-term benefit, thermodynamics, human philosophy, and human psychology, and its importance on uh, environmental issues. Then uh, I would like to offer my gratitude to Dr. Mondira Bordele, Madam, for nicely coordinating the webinar, and to Gracia Technology, for providing uh, technological support. With these words, I would like to conclude my speech. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saikya, for the detailed uh, note of appreciation. We thank you too, Tribeni, for your valuable contribution mm -hmm. to thank the success you, of you. this webinar. We shall now all rise for the national anthem to mark the closure of the webinar. Over to Gracia Technology for the national anthem. जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा 
चल जल धितरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाधा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे thanking all of you once again i wish you a pleasant evening ahead stay healthy stay safe take care and goodbye bye